What's up everybody and welcome to Atticus Live where we drink beer and talk about boats. Today we are going to be talking about essential weather tools for sailors and cruisers. <laughs> All right, what's up guys? I'm Jordan. And I'm Desiree. And we are newbie cruisers, so just take everything that we say today and always with a grain of salt. So before jumping into our tools and resources, just want to let you guys know if you want to comment while we're going through these, please feel free to. Also, we'll try to do shout outs when we can. Luckily, we've got Dave D.V. Zire, who's our moderator today. Thank you so much, Dave. You're the man. What's up, Dave? Co joining us from Ireland, staying up a bit late for us tonight. Um, also, if you're at all interested in becoming a moderator for one of our future live streams, shoot me a message on our Facebook page. Um, and we'll make you an honorary patron. So you can hop onto our Patreon Hangout um, and kind of help us steer the ship. Um, we do polls, contests, um, and do uh, a lot of patron-only live streams uh, to tell you guys kind of what we're doing day to day. So uh, also, if you're just interested in checking out our Patreon page, you can go to patreon.com backslash Project Atticus and help us reach our 500 challenge. Almost halfway there. All right, um, let's see. So uh, finally, we wanted to thank Mike and Laura Beal, who are two of our patrons, for inspiring today's topic. So they sent us a message asking about weather resources, and we thought, well, that's a really good question. There let's, you go. There's Mike Hey, and guys, Laura. <laughs> let's go ahead and dive into it. So Perfect thanks, time. guys. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about tip number one, which is weather resources for day sailing. Oh, right there. <laughs> My nice graphic. Hey, Rob S. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Glad to have you guys. Thanks for joining us. And no job, sup. And Michael Gregory. Hey. And sailing SB Someday. Yeah. Nice to see you again. All right. So uh, weather resources for day sailing. So the, the main two resources that I use for this, and, and what we're specifically talking about are resources on the internet, apps, stuff like that, um, that you can get real-time information and forecasting for your day sailing activities. So the two apps that I use the most are boom, right here and here. Um, over here we have Weather Underground. Um, I like Weather, really Weather Underground's main attraction is beach weather, right? So they, they're they there to tell you if you should go to the beach or not. What kind of, a, if it's, it is gonna rain, how hot it's gonna be, that kind of thing. But the thing I really like about them is they've got a great radar capability um, which when we worked on charter catamarans in Key West, I would look at that thing 20 times a day and we'd literally be able to like sail around a small squall because you could see that little squall moving in its direction and you could go right around it. So that's or, great for day sailing. Or you'd see like a squall in the distance and then you'd look really quickly on the radar to see if it's something on the outskirts or like a huge system coming your way. Outskirts? Outskirts. <laughs> I forgot my water bottle. Damn. Yeah. Oh shoot, no water bottle. <laughs> you can just slap me. Okay. <laughs> um, so anyway, so that's weather underground. Um, wind finder is sort of now, they, they used to be real different than uh, they are today, but the one thing that they still do really well is, as you can see on the screen below, they've got all those dots. You're looking at the Florida Keys in that image there. All those dots are actual weather stations that are gathering information. So like wind direction and wind strength, stuff like that. So you can actually, and the one I've got up right here is the one we used to always use in Key West. It was Sand Key Light. So they had a little weather station on that tower out in the water. So before we would go out sailing, you would check the sand key light information, see what the wind uh, direction and strength was, and know exactly what the conditions were like out there before you even left harbor. So that's another great, great resource. Um, but again, these are just for day sailing, um, which leads us... Is Winnie TV for the next one? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, got my outline messed up a little bit. So second Awkward. tip is, uh, and also if you guys have any resources um, that we've left out uh, that you use for day sailing, please let us know. Somebody was asking us about a fog app. 
We haven't really done much sailing in the fog in the last four or five years, so we don't really know, so let us know. And then now we'll move on to uh, weather resources for passage planning. Oh, passage planning. <laughs> All right. So this is that next level. And what? by the way, there, we got a lot of new people coming in today uh, for the live stream, so hello, everybody. Thanks for watching. Eric Rodden, H. Portillo, Thomas Golem. Boy, he's, he's in the house. Tom yeah. is in the house. Anyway, so I'm going to move on. So weather resources for passage planning. This is that next step. If you're not just looking to jump out of the harbor, puts around, and then head back in, if you're needing to get information for multiple days in, in various areas, um, then these are the resources that you would use. So number um, one is NOAA. Okay, so NOAA. Um, oh. Uh oh, I, I did that wrong. Oh. I put it on the wrong side. So That's okay. I'll just have to get close to Desiree here. So uh, what we got Can is we do it while I do this? over here. No, none of that. So over here is uh, one of the synoptic charts that Noah puts out. Um, this is under their Outlook tab um, on their website, and this is actually a product that the National Weather Service. Uh, puts out. So NOAA is the umbrella organization that controls both NWS and NHC, the National Hurricane Center. In the summer, the National Hurricane Center is like, I check it five times a day. If you're in the, if you're in the tropics, in the hurricane zone, you need to know, you know what's going on with hurricanes and cyclones. But anyway, so this I really like because in the U.S. and the Caribbean, you can get really great synoptic chart uh, for right now as well as forecasts. Um, and then below us is a synopsis that you can get for just about any region of the world. Um, if you're trying to learn about weather, uh, let me get rid of this real quick. Uh, if you're trying to learn about weather, those synopsis descriptions are really important because if you look at the synaptic chart, synaptic charts themselves, they can be a little bit confusing when you're just starting out trying to learn this stuff. Whereas the synopsis is going to break down all that information into the really important stuff that you really need to know about that region at that moment. So you're able to kind of get a visual for the greater, bigger picture what's going on and you're able to get a synopsis of what you should be paying attention to. And as you're learning about how to read weather, it's kind of a fun activity to look at the synaptic charts, synoptic charts and try to figure out what, in your head what you think is going on. And then you can kind of test yourself by reading the regional synopsis to see how right you were or how wrong you were. Yeah, very true. Uh, a couple more people, Steve Wick, hello. Bill Connolly, welcome. Um, we already said hey to Michael Gregory. Thanks for all the comments, man. <laughs> um, Roger53, rock on. Cool. Um, okay, so. Do you want to move on to windy.com? Are we doing windy? Windy. Windy. Okay, so what you're looking at here is a screenshot from windy.com, the actual uh, website. Now, you can get a, uh, an app that goes on your phone that does a really good job on your phone. But as you can see, and, and when you're actually at this website, I, I recommend everybody checks it out after, after the stream. Um, all of those little uh, wind indicator elements are moving as you're watching it. So it gives you a really interesting view of like how, um, let me, uh, sorry, let me get there. It gives you a really interesting view of like what the air movements, the, the larger picture of air movement um, due to pressure differences and everything else. So you learn that synoptic chart you learn wh where the fronts are, where the pressure gradients are, and then this is a way to see how that affects the wind itself. So how air is going to flow because of those larger systems. Um, and then, as you can see on the bottom of the image, they also have, uh, we looked up, I, I looked this information up for Isla Mujeres, and it has a really nice forecast for wind strength and direction for Isla Mujeres. So that is probably out of, all of the things that were elements that we're going to talk about today, all of the tools, windy.com has probably become my biggest go-to just for a quick like look to see what's going on both relatively locally and on a larger scale. 
I'm sorry, I zoned out a little bit. Were you, did you mention that Windy TV is great because it includes the average wind speed as well as gusts? No, so good point. Thank, thanks, Cooks. Um, so if you look here again, on the bottom, you'll see all of these numbers going on. Um, the, the top row of numbers is the average wind strength. What I really like about Windy is the bottom row of numbers is that gust strength. So the, the strength of the gust that you can expect at that time in that place. When you're looking at NOAA, when you're looking at a handful of other um, you know, outlets for information. What's up, Justin? We're using Sorry. a friend of ours uh, apartment come, room. Come say, hey. Thank you <laughs> for the live stream. Here's our today. buddy Justin. He, he's <laughs> letting us use his room. Cool. Thanks, Justin. You the man. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> man, it's tough living on a thirty-foot boat, man. You're like internet pirates. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, anyway, um, okay. So, uh, so back to that. So. This is a really important point, so I'm sorry that we got distracted on that, but almost every other outlet of weather information, specifically wind strength, they're always very conservative estimates because they're describing the average, like, constant wind strength. They're not describing the gusts. So if NOAA says that you're looking at 15 to 20, you know, knots of wind, that means that you can get gusts up to, like, 28 not m more than likely um so the the point is that when you're looking at windy you can actually see like oh wow the gusts are going to be pretty substantial or they're not going to be that bad so it gives you a better idea of what to expect and what pre to prepare for and when you were talking about noah did you talk about it in relation to hurricanes and like kind of what our i think you did like what our flow was for hurricane no, but I think that we'll do that maybe in the summer because I actually, so I went to the NHC's website, the National Hurricane Center, to get like a screenshot and because it's not hurricane season, they just don't have anything. And I could have tried to find archive like images, mm -hmm. but it's just not worth trying. Yeah, because so. Colin Jacob says, had my eyes glued to Noah uh, going through Hurricane Irma. And that's true. When, when yeah. we, we stayed in Isla Mujeres, which is in the hurricane region, um, so whenever we ha we heard of any system coming towards us, we'd always go to NOAA first. Um, and then later on, we'd, we'd go to Windy and kind of see like, okay, what is it going to gust to? Are we going to have to worry about it? Um, but yeah, Windy, I guess, is more for like northerly winds. And then we use NOAA for like hurricane, big, big, like... Uh, the, the NHC. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, we and everyone else in the tropics just lives on NHC normally. Oh. Uh, Sharon Dargar says, um, do y'all know of any resources to predict solar flares? Um, I don't off the top of my head, do you? <laughs> well, I'm sorry, what was it? Um, one of our users was asking, do y'all know of any resources to predict solar flares? Oh, no, I don't. That's a good question. If anybody else does out there, yeah. does anybody know information on uh, getting models and forecasts for solar flares? That would be great to know, like, okay, we're not going to be receiving any good, you know, weather facts images tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. That's oh, pretty cool. Oh, Sea Light Adventure says, Windy doesn't have as many weather models as Predict Wind. I don't think we've used Predict Wind. That, no, that's very true. Sea Light Adventures, thanks for, for uh, commenting that. Um, predict Wind is something that I'm going to start getting into more and more. Um, I also know that they've got a deal with iridium go mm. so that they're actually creating like an app that works with the iridium go to upload grip files and sea light adventures maybe you know more about that i we'd love to hear yeah. that let us know that's awesome um and also let us know what you like about predict wind and that goes for everybody here you know if you guys have other tools that you like we don't know everything and we like this learn. is just a system that we've come up with that works mm. essentially mm -hmm. And Bruce Malo says, so where and how are we receiving weather information when offshore? And we'll get to that in a couple of uh, comments. Um, so we're going to hop back into PassageWeather.com, which is our next tool that we use for passage planning. Uh, which is going to be this. Yes. Okay, so this is an image from PassageWeather.com. Now, as you can see, it's a lot less pretty than, say, Windy TV or Windy.com. 
Um, but the great thing about Passage Weather is that A, it really is that you can download these images with a very, uh, with bad internet. And you, and you can download uh, forecast images up to like a, seven days in the future. You can do wind, you can do waves, you can do pressure, uh, surface pressure uh, images, gradients. Um, so, I mean, realistically, that's um, about everything that you would really need um, when, say, going to Cuba. And, like, we actually did this. We finally found a place with internet <laughs> on the coast, the northwest coast of Cuba. Really wanted weather updates. We brought a thumb drive to one of the local resorts. They had a, internet, a little computer that you could use. And then uh, we went on to Passage Weather. And the internet in Cuba is terrible. Like, like the old school dial-up speed, if you're lucky, kind of thing. Um, and so the fact that Passage Weather has these super simple, really like small in size um, uh, images and files that you can download, that's extremely helpful. And then I think you were saying another thing that you liked about Passage Weather is that it's specifically for sailors, whereas like windy.com is just for people who are interested in weather. So with Passage Weather, you get wave height and wind direction as well. And that also goes for very earlier on when we were talking about WindFinder, right? They did, um, WindFinder tells you the, the wind speed and direction. And doesn't it tell you wave height? I don't remember. It, it can if there's buoys that are designed to... Right, to and actually I didn't know right. about this. Um, so Jordan was telling me that uh, the way that NOAA and other like weather resources collect their information is from like uh, towers that are on the ocean or even buoys. So when we were working on the water in Key West, that was really helpful because we could actually see what the, what the wind was blowing in in one direction at like Sand Key Light, for example. So that was pretty cool. All right, let's move on to... Da, 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 disorganized. I think you have a question. Uh, oh, yes. And if you guys have any other resources Cheers. we left out of our passage planning weather tools, let us know. And we're going to move on to tip number three, which is how to get weather while you're cruising. How Weather resources while cruising. Ah, uh, yes. All right. So we actually uploaded a video a couple weeks ago called Weather Facts, the best budget weather solution for sailors. Um, and that's where we talk about how we get uh, weather facts using an SSB receiver. Uh, you can also receive uh, GRIB files using a SAT phone or a SSB transceiver. And everything you need to know about that is in our video uh, that I mentioned before. Yeah, I mean, holy moly. Go, if you haven't watched already, go check out that weather facts video. <laughs> and then um, something I also wanted to bring up is um, while you're cruising, there's also some places that have a really strong cruiser's net. And a lot of times, if you hop on at a certain time every morning, uh, somebody will be talking about the weather, especially if there's a hurricane going on, everyone's gonna be talking about it on the net. Sometimes in the Anchorage, you can find people who have you know, more information than others. So it's a very strong uh, network once you're actually cruising. Um, you can also tune in to Chris Parker on the net uh, or the radio and we haven't really done that yet because we actually used to run the Isla Mujeres cruisers net and they overlapped in time. So we don't know too much about it other than you can actually pay him to take a look at your itinerary and he'll actually give you advice on when he thinks you should leave. So that's pretty cool. Um, as far as the super yachts that we used to work on, they actually hired a meteorologist um, to, to be their go-to weather person. They could actually call them and talk to them and they'd like tell tell the yacht captain like this is what I think you should do. Yeah, he would receive, <laughs> I mean he would receive images if he wanted them, but for the most part the guy would just say like this is what you should yeah, do. Yeah, which would be so cool. Um, if any of you guys are meteorologists, we'll give you our number. <laughs> um, and then last thing I want to talk about is while you're cruising, uh, talk to fishermen. A lot of times they know about what's going to happen with the weather before most other people do. When we were in Cuba, we kind of figured even if we went ashore, when you ask someone for a question who's ashore, sorry, when you ask someone a question about weather ashore, they don't really know what you're talking about as far as like wind speeds and you know the bigger pressure systems that are happening. But if you ask a fisherman, they know exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. Real quick, uh, Mike Bale was asking on passage, do you find yourself altering course due to weather? And then Michael Gregory actually uh, 
gave a great answer. It depends what mood you're in and what you're facing and where you want to go, whether you want to change your course depending on the weather. I, and I agree with uh, Michael, but I would add that it, it really depends on how long your passage is. Because if your passage is within three days, um, the forecasts when you left are probably extremely accurate, um, depending on what part of the world you're in. But especially the Caribbean, like forecast models are extremely accurate up to three days. So if your passage is within three days, then you probably had very accurate information leaving. And so you can make your course based on um, the, the prevailing weather conditions. Um, it's when you're doing a longer passage, like a Pacific crossing, that if you see like a low, or especially like the Atlantic, you know, if you see a low cruising along the Atlantic, you might kind of try to loop around it instead of going right, right through it. So can I interrupt? Yeah. Rob S. says, before you move on to the next topic, is becoming proficient at reading weather more difficult than becoming a ballerina? You really need <laughs> to know. Rob. <laughs> Rob, I'm glad you're here, buddy. Cheers. <laughs> All right. So, hello, Sailor. It, sail it, I'd Oreo. say it's about the same, you know, personally. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So, let's move on to topic number four, which is essential weather books. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Essential weather books. All right, so we're going to start off by talking about Alan Watts' Instant Weather Forecasting. He also has another book called Instant Storm Forecasting. Um, that, um, that's backwards. That's backwards. <laughs> hmm. That's, that's we just got a new webcam, so. We'll new webcam. Have to Very excited. Figure that out. <laughs> yeah. Um, if, if you can talk for a second, I can... Yeah, so uh, what we use this book for is essentially we'll kind of use NOAA to figure out what's happening on the broader scheme of things with weather. Then we'll go to windy.com, for example, um, to like get more information nice. about what the, what's happening with the wind speeds. And then we'll actually go to this book to see what all that information theoretically means like in a real world application. Like so, on the ground. Yeah. So that has really cool pictures and then you'll use this to go outside and just kind of look at the sky and be like, well, does that look like this or this? And then you can start a, you can kind of start to put all the pictures together. Yeah. So quite literally, the majority of the book is a picture. <laughs> you, can, you can get in there. It's just a picture and then a very thorough description of like, oh, I mean, this says this is the major inference so like this is if you see this then like this description is generally what you should take away from it major clues so a handful of elements that that uh you know uh you should be looking for to make that inference and then an explanation and then just a a lot of a large a, a lot of description of all the different variables that come into play for that specific situation and again, this right here is an air mass trough. So this is showing you what a trough approaching would look like. And then cumulonimbus is the next one. I mean, like, the point is, it's a very small book, very easy to read, and it's like a field guide for weather. So if you, what? Oh, I'm just saying. Okay, no gotta problem. move on. So, <laughs> but the reason I'm going in such depth, this is probably my favorite weather book that we have. Um, because you can find books that describe how weather patterns function and interact with each other and, and how pressure uh, gradients and differences in the atmosphere make certain, you know, have certain effects. But this shows you if you're on the ground observing something, what, that, what does that look like? What does it mean for the future? What, uh, what can you deduce from that, from what you can see? And, this, and that's what this book shows you. So I highly recommend this book. The, the companion book to it is Instant Storm Forecasting, which kind of takes the exact same principle to the next, to the next level. Uh, SV Offseason says, Weatherman, the only job you can be wrong 60% of the time and keep your job. <laughs> Touche. Yeah. Um, it, is, it is a tough job. Uh, I'm pretty terrible at reading weather, but I have a good teacher. So, you know, whenever we're like bored or something, I'll look at the sky and be like, does that mean this is happening? And then teacher over here will tell me what's going on. All right. So second book is Niger Calder's Cruising Handbook. Um, Nigel. Sorry. What did I say? Niger. <laughs> Sorry, Nigel. 
That's a country, not a person. <laughs> Niger, Nigel Calder's Cruising Handbook. Um, and what's really cool, this book you can use if you know absolutely nothing about weather. It has a whole weather section in it. So this is a good place to start if you just want to do like weather 101. Yeah. What's also really cool about it is it actually talks about what creates the trade winds and like, you know, where all these big systems are coming from that affect you as a sailor on the small scale. Yeah, so this, this can give you that foundational weather knowledge. So like Desiree was talking about, like the trade winds and most of the major wind systems on the planet and currents as well come from the rotation of the earth. And this book has a section that goes very deeply into that. Um, not to mention that this is one of my favorite uh, resources for a cruiser, period, anyway. So Just want to say hello to Sailing Bangarang. Um, I don't see your comment now. But Bangarang! We've been friends on Facebook, so nice to see you. And we don't have a Bitcoin wallet, um, but we do have a PayPal account. Um, let's see. All right, so let's move on to ba -ba -da, A Gentleman's Guide to Passages South by Bruce Van Sant. And, he actually, and that's Bruce right there. Yeah. That's how you write a book. You just put your damn <laughs> picture on the cover. What a dude. And actually how he wrote this book was he started taking notes, like just at a bar, like people would ask him about his passages south. And he would start writing down on like, while he was drinking, like on a, on a napkin and giving it to people, all of his tips. And then somebody started collecting all of the knowledge that he was throwing down and they convinced him to write a like a just like a PDF and then it grew into this big book. So it's a really cool book. Yeah, Sea Light Adventure says love that book. This is this is definitely not a secret. <laughs> like, this is this is a, a very popular book. So the main point of this book is to give for the most part sailors that are in Florida or the eastern the east coast give them like an idea of a, a strategy to get to the Lesser Antilles via the Bahamas and the Greater Antilles. Um, so, you know, you'd be tempted to say, well, if you're not in that situation, then what's the point? Well, because his strategy is to use the land effects of the islands in the Greater Antilles to help you sail to windward. So he talks a lot about using um, land breezes at night, waiting for the land to cool down and to create a breeze coming off the land, uh, using catabatic winds to your advantage, um, making sure that you don't, that you make sure you're not caught out uh, when the sea breeze comes in and makes the winds even stronger coming against you. So like all of this stuff, using islands and land masses to your advantage and even like fronts, in, in a sense the first half of this book is a guide to how to sail to windward without being close hauled and beaten. You're just getting the crap beat out of you. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I like this book. It was very eye opening, and I learned a lot when I when I read it. And Rob S says, "Your thoughts on using a, bar a barometer in weather prediction?" Um, and that's a great idea to compound all of your knowledge with take like keeping an eye on that barometer. A lot of people have it in their watch log. Um, I, we, I don't, we haven't really done that yet, but we should add that. Well, but we our barometer is is electronic now, so it records the the levels for the last 24 hours on an hourly basis, so you can see the trend. Right. Um, right. But anyway, but no, very good point, Rob. Like it, and that's the thing is you got to have these redundant strategies so that just in case one thing fails, you at the end of the day, if you've got a barometer, you can know like very, very accurately when that thing starts to drop quickly, hmm. that you better start getting prepared for yeah, something gnarly. That's scary. Um, SV Manamana says, uh, just came into your live stream late. Will you have a list of books you use somewhere? Yes. And yes, it'll be in the description below with um, links that are, we just started an Amazon affiliate link account. So if you are gonna buy any of these books, and again, we only recommend these because we have them and we love them. If you are gonna buy them, it would help us a lot, help us out a lot if you can use those links. All right, so let's move on to ba -ba -dum, Storm Tactics by Lynn and Larry Party. Man, oh, gotta love these guys. I have included this book just because we need to have a party book. I, I keep looking at the old, the old 
camera, I'm sorry. Mm. Um, the, uh, I wanted to just have a party book in this, but at the same time, like this book is a great, it gives you a, a good idea of a strategy that you could take on for yourself if you do get caught out in severe weather. Um, it happens to be the strategy that we have, which is to heave to. That's, the stra that's our strategy is heave to, like wait it out, let the storm pass you by in the safest, most comfortable um, fashion possible. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of the newer people, a lot of the newer philosophies are to run with the storm, which has its own advantages. So, but anyway, Storm Tactics by Lynn and Larry Party. These are tactics that have been used by sailors for hundreds of years. Um, and so it's, it, it really is just, a great way to a learn their strategy and b they've got a lot of anecdotes in this giving you examples of you know when the shit hit the fan what it looked like what they did what mistakes they made all that kind of stuff kind so. of personalizes it yeah. um dave and shannon dardar say i find looking out the window my most accurate weather prediction method so far on a daily basis and that's a really good point like just once you decide you want to start learning how to read weather just go outside and look at the sky and look at the clouds uh, see if you can see which direction the, the trees or whatever you can see are are leaning in and try to kind of test yourself um, all right let's move on to um, heavy weather sailing by Adler Coles so I don't have that book um, <laughs> that's actually a book that um, I've I've borrowed in the past and I highly recommend it and the reason is similar to storm tactics um, heavy weather sailing is a is this one guy what is named Adler Cole mm -hmm. Adler Cole mm -hmm. Cole he like he has done a lifetime's worth of heavy weather offshore racing so like in that sense cruisers would say screw this the weather sucks I'm not going anywhere offshore racers if the race is that day they're racing and so he has a lot of examples actual anecdotes from his life of being caught out in really nasty weather um, and to me the great thing about that it when you're when it when you start to have that dream of going cruising and you start to tell your friends like I want to buy a boat and sail to the South Pacific or whatever then your friends say well what about storms dude like you're gonna die <laughs> and like and unless you actually educate yourself on what a storm on a small sailboat looks like like what that experience would look like and feel like then you're just you just live in this like you know dark shroud of terror you know <laughs> so uh, Adler Cole's book is an entire book of anecdotes of him getting caught out in seriously nasty weather and so for that reason, I highly recommend it for anyone who's considering doing this because A, you can decide if that's something you're interested in. Like, you can be like, oh, I didn't know it was gonna suck that much, count me out. Mm -hmm. Or you can just be informed and say, you know what, that's actually not that bad. It's a challenge, but it's not, it's not that bad. And Sea Light Adventure says, do you have a para anchor? And we, we put it on our wish list for our wedding registry. Yeah. And in fact, can I add to that? Rob S. was saying uh, the, the Drogue, the Jordan series Drogue. And um, so those are the two opposing philosophies. Um, the para anchor is essentially helping the boat to stay hove to mm -hmm. properly. Because at, at the end of the day, whether you're running with the storm or you're heaving to, the thing you want to avoid is broaching. That is the thing everyone's trying to avoid. Um, the para anchor helps you, or sea anchor, helps you to avoid broaching when you're hove to. Mm. The drogue helps you to avoid broaching when you're sailing downwind, you're, you're trailing stuff behind and it keeps your ass end mm. from getting pushed How down. How much are each one of those about? Are they comparable? So you guys might know better than me, but I believe that good drogues, now a drogue could be as simple as like a couple of lines that you like let out. Mm. Like back in the day, they used to just like tie some wood to lines mm. and let, let it out. Mm -hmm. you know I mean, it's anything that creates drag. 
but like actual like cone drogues, which are what most of the new uh, drogues are. They're like these like nesting cones that nest inside of each other and create a lot of drag. Um, I believe they're more expensive than parahankers, but I'd be really curious if you guys know cost-wise what's cheaper. Cool. But we are gonna do probably a um, para-anchor rather than a drogue. And that's just because I'm just a fan of waiting it out in a safer situation than like actually making progress somewhere, but in a less, in, in a less ideal scenario. Um, Lynn and Larry Party actually talk about this. They, they talk about the, the risk of the, the relative comfort of sailing downwind in really adverse situations because everything seems relatively benign. Like they're, they're, the boat's not experiencing much, hmm. you know, comparatively much, much motion and, and you just can't feel the forces. But boy, you try and turn that boat around in the trough of a wave, mm. and like you got, it's like the perfect storm. Like you got that one chance, you got one shot at that, and um, and and then all of a sudden it it hits you like this is way gnarlier than I thought it was. Uh, what's up, Dallas Bob? Thanks for joining us tonight. He's uh, Dallas Bob actually met. Um, a couple who circumnavigated on an Allied Sea Wind in 1973, I believe. So he reached out to us on Facebook oh, and said, hey, huh. thanks for joining us, Bob. And he said, I learned a lot from how to sail around the world by Hal Roth. He focuses on weather and is a big fan of the Jordan series drogue. Mm, yeah, rock on. So Dallas, Bob, um, great comment. Um, Hal Roth was actually the very first um, the very first cruising anything that I read, I believe, and I can't even remember which of his books it was. Hmm. I think it was called Always a Distant Anchorage or something like that. Um, but anyway, so Hal Roth is great too, and I underplay Hal Roth. We don't have any of his books on the boat, but totally agree with you. Get it? Like Hal Roth is a great great writer. Yeah, so let's move on. Also, if you guys have any more resources that you use to passage plan um, and get good weather information, please let us know. Um, we're going to be talking about topic number five, which is Jordan's illuminating guide to knowing weather like a boss. Yes! <laughs> awesome! So essentially, so awesome. um, based on what we talked about before, it's just a simple flow on how to kind of go about your 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 self-education process if you're really serious about learning weather. Yeah, so this is what I did to go from, I don't want to say zero to hero, I'll say zero to like somewhat... Ballerina. To ballerina. Let's just say zero to ballerina. That's for you, Rob S. <laughs> yeah, no, but let's just call it like zero to like halfway knows a little bit about what they're talking about. Um, what I did is I would combine um, using instant weather forecasting. Well, you said to start off with a synoptic chart. Right, okay, I'm sorry. So uh, what I would do is I would do the synoptic charts from NOAA. Look at those. Look at, and, and for those of you who aren't, aren't familiar, you've seen a synoptic chart before on like your local uh, news channel with the, the, the meteorologist, the, the weather guy. You know, like uh, Ron Burgundy, like that map behind him is a synoptic chart. It shows you like cold fronts, warm fronts, lows, highs, you know, all that kind of stuff. So you look at that first. And what that is, is it's, it's through symbols showing you where the major pressure gradients are, right? So like you'll have like high pressure and low pressure and where that transition is, is where that front is. So you look at that, you get the general picture of what's going on in your area. Then you go to Windy TV and you can see what the winds are doing at that very moment. So now you're able to sort of mentally see, here's a big picture with the synoptic chart, what's going on from a, from a weather standpoint. Then you go to windy.com, you can see how that's affecting the wind, what winds are doing because of those larger elements. Then you open up this bad boy and you can see like you can try and gauge what the sky looks like for you, look that up in the book, 
and then put all of that together. And if you do that regularly, and you don't even need to own a sailboat for this, if you are planning on cruising someday and plan, and you're gonna do it years down the road, this is a great way to practice and get better at understanding and reading the weather. The ultimate goal with Jordan's illuminating guide to knowing weather like a boss is that you can do this in reverse down the road. So eventually, after you've done this, you know, every every other day for a year, like you can look at the sky, remember what this said about that. You can think to yourself, this looks like it's a cold front. And then you can go from there to the larger picture and assert, like essentially reverse engineer what you're seeing in the sky into what the great the larger picture is that's causing that and that helps you to have a much better understanding of um, kind of the, the weather around you and once you're at that level also like whenever you're outside and you experience a change in weather try to notice what that feels like so just a personal anecdote when Jordan and I uh, moved to Key West I knew absolutely nothing about sailing or weather and I thought he was a magician because we were at a bar um, outside and all of a sudden he's like it's gonna start raining and I'm just like what <laughs> like how does he know this and it started pouring rain um, and what happened was we experienced a cold gust so now whenever I'm on watch or just anywhere I know okay if the weather if the wind picks up really quickly and it's cold like it's gonna start raining you've got hands a, down <laughs> yeah you've got a squall coming yeah so anyways, um, all right, let's move on to our Atticus Chugs. We've got three today, so get your drinks ready. <laughs> so the comment of the week goes to King Cactus 20,000. 20, 20, 20,000, that's <laughs> a lot. <laughs> nice says, one, King Cactus. He says, got the notification that you guys were live while I was at work. Thought I'd try to listen for a bit on my phone, but got busted and had to wait till I got home to watch. So, sorry we got you in trouble, but thanks for your dedication. Cheers to you. Cheers, buddy. Dude, mm. nicely done. All right, chug number two. We want to give a huge shout out to Rob S., who sent us a very generous Ooh, donation. Whoop. Sorry. Sent us a very de generous donation of $100 um, to go towards a hammock and uh, our hard dodger project, which we're kind of working at right now. So, so thanks, Rob S. Th thanks, Rob. And we, in fact, I wanted to talk to you about this because I already talked to him in an email. Oh, so we're doing the hammock we're chair. We're sorted. We're gonna get a hammock chair because we hammock already chair. we already have a hammock, <laughs> and every time Jordan walks down the Mercado in um, downtown Isla Mujeres, he's just like drooling at these hammock chairs. And I keep trying to talk them down in price, <laughs> and they're like, nope. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so thanks, Rob S. Uh, Atticus Chug Chug number three goes to Jeannie Danley. Um, and she's the winner of our Atticus ID challenge. So uh, every couple of weeks we have a cool picture of a fish or the coral or shark or dolphin or manatee that we see. Um, and if you can identify what that species is first, we will give you a cheers on our live stream. So cheers to Jeannie. Cheers, Jeannie. All Rock right. On. Um, also, we had a really fun caption this contest uh, about two weeks ago, um, but I haven't had time to go through all the submissions because I had to fly back to the United States for a funeral. But we'll do that uh, and announce the winners during our le next live stream, and we'll probably turn to our patrons to help us figure out who the winner will be because we got over a hundred. Um, what do you call it? Submissions for the caption this photo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thanks, guys, for all your creativity. Um, but I mean, just in general, if any of you guys haven't hopped over to our Facebook page yet, it is really fun. And we're, <laughs> we're trying our best to make sure that every day we're uploading something interesting and fun for you guys. So it's a whole nother level for you guys to, to kind of interact with Project Data. And what's up, Tom, Tom McFarland? Hey, hey Tom. Cheers, since I have no redeeming skills. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're really good at showing up on our live streams Tom, and making us happy. <laughs> I don't believe that for a second, Tom. <laughs> All right, so um, a question from one of our viewers this week was Vanessa Reclaus, who Vanessa Reclaus asks, weather-wise, what's the worst you've experienced while sailing and your recommended reactions to similar situations? So first of all, she used the word whilst. <laughs> Not while, whilst. She's European. So well done. Well done. <laughs> She's my god sister, actually. Oh, nice. My hero. Whilst. Whilst. 
Whilst being up. my hero, she asked anyway, a question. Sorry. <laughs> Go on. Um, I already read it, but she was saying, what's the worst you've experienced whilst sailing? Oh, you're asking me? Yeah. Oh, so <laughs> the worst that I've experienced whilst sailing... Um, on Atticus, let's... So much okay, so my recommended situation... Okay, so let's just say on Atticus, because we haven't sailed a lot on Atticus in bad weather. Um, definitely my worst situations have been on big motor yachts, but... Um, on Atticus, we had that one <clears throat> freak squall while we were coming back up from Ascension, Baia de Ascension, hmm. and um, and I just remember we got we didn't get knocked down, but we like we suddenly we weren't we didn't get our canvas down quick enough. So you know, and as like any sunny summer squally day. There's squalls everywhere, but when you're in between them, you're dealing with like 10 knots of breeze. So in order to move it all, you have to put up everything you've got, all the sail that you've got, and then the squall comes and you gotta bring it all back down. So we were a little bit slow on bringing it down before this one squall hit. Boom, you know, like 35 knots or something like that. Not a lot, but we had a lot of sail area. Anyway, so that was the worst situation, but like, what do I recommend the attitude being? So I tell Desiree to do something. I can't remember what it was. And I kind of barked the order at her. And she started to just sort of like freeze up hmm. and panic. And I realized that that's because I was creating this environment of, of panic, <laughs> you know? So like as the captain or as the person like with more experience, the the reaction of your crew is very much due to how you're handling the situation so i would recommend that a veneer of calm is important no matter what you're actually feeling because it will keep those around you from getting worked up as well um and i'll just jump in that was actually uh from we were going from uh Sarasota to the Dry Tortugas. No, this this one I'm talking about was after we left Cozumel. Oh, I thought I freaked out and I freaked out way before. No, maybe. Yeah, I freaked out a little bit. Embarrassing, but I had a panic attack. <laughs> um, but I guess like um, just if you're thinking about cruising, something that I learned going through um, like a kind of intense weather situation on Atticus was, I guess every time you kind of learn to trust your boat more and more. Um, and if you ever have the idea, like, maybe we should reef, go ahead and reef. <laughs> um, and the, then, yeah, the common phrase is, if you're thinking that you should reef, you're too late. Yeah. Like, I know, I need this. I, I forgot the, sti the spray bottle this <laughs> time, <laughs> Steve. <laughs> All right. Wait, just slap me. No, I don't, I can't do it. <laughs> um, so yeah. the other thing I was going to say is... Um, maybe like, you know, it's ideal, <laughs> he tears himself, oh, yeah. <laughs> what a martyr, Yeah. gosh. I get it, I interrupt her a lot, <laughs> I'm sorry, like, it's a problem. Uh, I forgot what I was saying, <laughs> anyway, let's move on, so, um, as soon as you realize there's a storm on the horizon, just go ahead and reef, it's annoying, maybe you'll have to put the sail back up, but just reef, just for your peace of mind. Um, also, practice heaving too before you set out for your big adventure. Um, when we were going from Sarasota to the Dry Tortugas, we actually had to reef for the first time to slow Atticus. Sorry, we had to heave two for the first time to slow Atticus down. Ah, thanks, Tom. You just gave us <laughs> 10 bucks. You the man. Thanks, that Tom. That will pay for our dinner tonight. <laughs> you are the man. Thank I'm you very much. I'm not cooking. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's move on to um, the Cuba controversy. Oh, so, controversy. Um, do you want to bring up those comments that we had? Yes. All right. Um, let's do that. So let me think. Yes, here we go. Okay, so some of you guys may have seen on this last episode where we did our illegal excursion to the inland part of Cuba and then did some rock climbing there, which was also technically illegal. We got a handful of comments regarding the illegal nature of our activities and the fact that we were visitors in that country. And so we want to we want to address this topic immediately in an open calm fashion in a super calm fashion i mean i'd like to have a debate about it so you guys if you have any thoughts on this please let me know 
I'm going to try. Oh, Rob, Rob S. Rob S. was oh, there backing <laughs> us up, which we appreciate, Rob S. So let me just go ahead and read. I, he said, Harold Steed says, I disagree with your approach to the local laws. It's disrespectful, especially from a foreigner. I wouldn't encourage anyone to break laws in a foreign country, which is essential what you're doing by posting on YouTube. Um, so, um, and then we had another comment. Go on. Um, D of the C. We also want to say, Harold Steed, thank you for your feedback um, and how you phrased that. Um, D of the C. Um, I, we appreciate your input, but we would also appreciate a little bit of a less aggressive tone next time, just so we can have an open discussion. But he said, pretty effing stupid to risk getting your boat impounded and going to jail. This is why other countries dislike Americans. You think you're special and the rules don't apply. I was just in Cuba six months ago. It's really easy legally. Even got a beautiful stamp in my passport. P.S. Even dumber to flaunt your stupidity online. Okay. So, Let's just say, first of all, we actually went to Cuba legally. So we went through the legal process. We filed form 3300, I think it was. Yeah. Um, so going to Cuba for us, we did it legally. Um, from a US standpoint. From a US standpoint. From a Cuba standpoint, they don't care. Yeah. And so um, talking about the idea of disrespecting people uh, versus laws, um, we kind of have a lot to say about that. But essentially, um, well, I'll let you take over. <laughs> sure. So this Here we is. Go. I know. Buckle your seat belts. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to try to keep this as like bland as I can. Um, like my, my viewpoint on this is that our goal is to respect the people of the countries that we're visiting. And I will say our kind of like motto or the reason that why, why we're doing Project Atticus is to know our world. So we want to understand people from all over the world. Um, go on. Exactly. Like learning, like actually, like for a, just a little bit experiencing the lifestyle and the, and the way of life of people from around the world is extremely eye-opening. So that is our goal, is to get to know people from other walks of life, get to experience their way of life, and fundamentally like thank them for taking us into their lives. Now, you know, Harold talks about um, like how breaking the laws in a foreign country is disrespectful. And I fundamentally disagree with that. I think that it is the job of any free thinking human being on the planet to question the validity of every single law of every country anywhere on the planet. Laws hold no other purpose than to benefit the people under which they regulate. In the, Cuba's case. In Cuba's case. With this law in particular. We broke two laws. The first law was that you are not allowed to leave your boat and go ashore anywhere unless it is a designated like tourist uh, zone with like a marina and everything else. The reason that they have that law is because Cubans en masse want to leave Cuba. And that's a problem for the Cuban government. And it's been a problem for every communist state ever. Like people want to leave. So they have to actually take actions to keep people from leaving. And one of the, the ways that they do that is to make sure that boaters that are visiting don't leave their boats unattended anywhere that's not guarded by, by like security. So that includes leaving it at anchor to go ashore. In my opinion, and, and I'll say my opinion, that is disrespectful to the Cuban people. That is a law and that you, oppresses. And you don't have to be so contra like heated. You know? I'm sorry. Let's, this is a conversation. Yeah. Cool it out. Cool it out. So, in, in my opinion, a law like that is specifically designed to oppress the Cuban people, to limit their freedom of mobility, to limit the choice of where they want to be and what kind of a government they want to live under. Um, so, do I feel it is disrespectful to? break that law? No. And in fact, 
neither did Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King said, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. And I couldn't agree with that more. And now Harold seems to imply that because I'm not a citizen of that country, I, you know, that same sort of uh, uh, civil disobedience doesn't apply. And I disagree. I just flat out disagree. I think that foreigners and citizens can take that role in um, judging each law individually based on the merits of that law and for and, and and not in any way thinking that a law because it is a law should be should be necessarily respected for that reason alone so to kind of sum it up we found this law unjust towards the cuban people who we really wanted to get to know so then we assessed the risk involved with leaving our boat um, unattended and we decided that we would take that risk um, maybe in the future that could be bad for tourism down the line because maybe they'll start enforcing uh, going ashore more and more um, but that's kind of the only downside that we see to it um, and as far as being you know disrespectful americans um, Rob S. mentioned that uh, a lot of times cruisers are often the most kind of conscientious um, travelers um, because, you know, we're actually living in these places that we're visiting and we really want to fit in. So um, our goal was to um, meet the Cuban people and we did and um, we had an amazing experience. We don't feel like we hurt anyone negatively. Um, and that's the key. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Yeah, that was all I was going to say. Yeah. Uh, spray me. Where's the bottle? <laughs> That's okay. Sorry. That's okay. Sorry. Oh, well, Harold Steed's actually here. Thanks for joining hey. us, Harold. Hey, and Harold. again, we really do appreciate your input. So thanks for thanks for voicing your opinion. You know, I think this is a very good topic of discussion. And we just wanted you to understand where we're coming from. We totally get where you're coming from as well. We just, we just disagree fundamentally. And that's okay. So thanks, it, thanks for watching. Yeah, and and then the other the other law that we did break was also uh, rock climbing Cuba, and and that comes from another very <clears throat> it's it, it's a different in my opinion I object to that law from a different standpoint than I object to the law of leaving your boat and going ashore. The in my opinion, countries like Cuba, you know, communist dictatorships, generally err on the side of making everything illegal that increases their control and then they're able to specify what is legal at that point where in in a lot of other countries the mindset is the opposite you you pinpoint what is illegal and the rest is legal in cuba it seemed to be the opposite and so rock climbing what definitely fell under that category because like we would walk down the street with like a, my rope like coiled up and tied to my back past you know the police each day that we were there they've they've installed bolts into the cliff walls for sport climbing i mean it's not a secret the rock climbers go to the same places every day so i think like one of our uh audience members replied to uh to uh Harold's comment in in the video they were saying that you know, you uh, a lot of these laws aren't respected by anybody because that's the cultural environment that the government has created. So, in my opinion, that's another example of you know disobeying a law that is unnecessary is a positive thing for everybody, whether you are a citizen or not. And I would just say, you know, it is a gray area. We're not 100% right the views of you know harold steed probably aren't 100 percent right it's th that's why there's controversy there's no nobody coming in to say like this is yes and this is no um let's see uh tj early and after i read this comment we're going to move on to the next one it, he says don't the cuban people benefit more by meeting people from a different country not to mention the money that that you spent while inland is it disrespectful for the government to try to repress its people uh, or he said it is res disrespectful for the government to try to repress its people and again even that comment like there's pros and cons to it you could i lived in india for a year and 
um, you know, women weren't supposed to go out by themselves. Um, and I kind of wanted to be this young woman who shared my views on femininity um, with my host sister and host aunt. And I wanted to go out and play soccer with all the boys. Um, but then I realized later on, I'm actually, I might be negative, negatively impacting my host sister's um, life if she starts to have this idea of, you know, she needs to stand up for herself, she needs to go out by herself, um, and she's still forced in that culture where it's hard to do that. So again, I don't think there's a right and a wrong, it's just an interesting thing to talk about, and that was our decision, um, and if you guys disagree with it, that's fine, um, but we just wanted to share our perspective. So let's go on to uh, another comment from Neil Stewart. Um, he said, great video, hard work paid off, you probably know this, but when you do catch a fish, a shot of rum in the gills will stop the fish from flopping all over the boat. Did you know that? I did not know that. Yeah, apparently you can I also use a that. spray bottle with some alcohol if you're a little bit stringent about your <laughs> waste wasting alcohol while you're um, fishing. <laughs> um, and go ahead and ask us questions, guys. This is open forum. We've got a couple more minutes. I'm going to go ahead know. and move on to some more questions from before. Um, we've got Ed Chamberlain says, um, I'm curious about your strategy for sailing east against the trades from the Yucatan. The usual thinking is to wait for the trades to go south and moderate, uh, as well as traveling at night when the winds lay down. Is it applicable to the south coast of Cuba also? Great, great question. <laughs> so, this, okay, so like uh, this is actually really interesting. We actually just messaged, um, uh, uh, Sailing Uma, you know, we, we, we talk with them here and there, and we were, we were asking them, like, what, you know, what advice do you have going to windward um, in the Greater Antilles? You want a beer? No, I love water. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so in going, going to windward, you know, a lot of that is covered in, you know, passages south. So he talks about how do you make hundreds of miles of progress right into the trades. Um, one thing that we're excited about is we're doing things slightly unconventionally in that we will be on the south coast of both Cuba and Hispaniola. So what that means is that, I mean, I'm trying to get out of here as soon as we can because as long as we're in the winter, we've got northerlies that are associated with cold fronts that we can use to make some progress. Being on the south coast of these large islands, we're not going to get any of the wave action associated or the lee shore situation that you would get if you're on the north side, which most people heading from the United States would find themselves in that situation. So our goal would be to use the northerlies as often as possible, letting the worst of the front blow past us. And generally in the winter, you know, you normally have that first day that's really gnarly and then like the second day that's a little bit calmer and still out, a bit out of the north. And so we would kind of use that second day to make, make some progress. On top of that, we would use the, um, the land breeze, so sailing at night, where the land cools down faster than the sea does and you get uh, high pressure over the land and you get wind coming off of the land. That helps you get a little bit of a breeze from, from the beam. Um, and then on top of that, the, the big question for me is, how are we going to leave Mexico and get to Cuba? And so I'm thinking we're going to go sail down to Cozumel, which is about a day's sail to the south. Gus C says, Argentina. I know, Australia. Gus. Ugh. I'd like to, but I just don't think Atticus is ready for cold weather. It's just really, it's not, uh, it's not... It, it, it's not designed effectively for that. You know what I mean? Like it, it, we don't have insulation. We don't have a like a fully hard dodger. Um, anyway, so um, uh, so what we're going to do is we're I think we'll sail down to Cozumel. That way we can sail due uh, like not even due east, but like what I want to do is wait for the wind to come a little bit out of the south. We've had really strong winds out of the south southeast for the last two days and man this is exactly what i would have gone for like this is we would have left the with these conditions so what i want to do is get to cosmel pray for some like south southeast conditions maybe southeast and that way we can close haul it 
you know, on a starboard tack and then be able to let the current ride us all the way up to Cabo San Antonio. So that's what I'm thinking. Okay, so real quick, Mike Beal, we don't have an Amazon banner on our website, so we get a little money when you buy other things, but we did find out that if you just use any of those Amazon links and then you buy something in that same session, uh, we get a little kickback. So that's what you can do for now. We will look into getting a banner on our website because um, we think it's a, a cool way to share products we like and also make a little bit on the side. Um, all right, um, let's see. We're gonna go ahead and wrap things up for tonight. So if you've enjoyed tonight's live stream, uh, please give, up, uh, give us a thumbs up. Um, and if you want to make sure you don't miss another live stream in the future, you can text the word Atticus, A-T-T-I-C-U-S, uh, to 43506. Um, and we're gonna try to do our next live stream in two weeks from today. Uh, we're gonna probably do every other week from now on because we started working on our hard dodger and water maker and we're kind of getting back into a lot of boat projects. Um, all right, um, Jordan wants to thank uh, Dave tonight for moderating. Yeah, thanks Dave, you are the man. Dave has been super, super, super helpful, encouraging, and uh, just generally awesome. So thank you, Dave. If any of you guys want to become a moderator, please let us know. We got tons of perks for you if you're interested in, and uh, and it's you know it's a fun. I I, I I like to think it'd be a fun fun job. <laughs> um, also, if you guys are interested in becoming patrons, you know we've got our Patreon hangout page on Facebook, which is really fun, really awesome. I try to post something like about every day about my progress with the projects I'm doing. Desiree does the same with what she's doing. So it's just like a whole nother level um, of, of like getting to be able to get insight into the cruising lifestyle. Yep, so. and be sure to check out uh, this week's episode on Thursday and we're gonna do a little, we meet some lobster fishermen so they take us out and let me uh, get a couple lobsters. Murder a couple lobsters. <laughs> um, so you see my savage side a little bit. Um, and then we explore the Northwest Cuban coast a little bit more and then head over to Mexico. So we're almost getting ca caught up to where we are now. So thanks again for joining us tonight. Um, Harold Steed, again, we really appreciate your input um, and how you phrased um, you know, your criticism. So we will catch you guys next time. Okay, guys. And also there was a ton of you guys that we didn't get to comment back to or bring up your comments. Sorry, we, we just ran out of time this time. We had a lot of things that we wanted to get through, but Please come hang out with us next Monday and we'll do it all again. And you can go ahead, once this video is published, if you have any other questions, go ahead and just comment uh, in the comment section and we'll try to get to them that way. Okay, rock on. Thanks for coming in, guys. That was a great time. We'll catch Cheers. you guys next week.